Our next speaker uh, has worked closely with our region on, Brownfields pro on our Brownfields program, and in his new role, he's assisting us with overall economic development efforts. Tim Sullivan joined the Department of Economic and Community Development in January 2014 and was quickly elevated by the governor in January 2015 to deputy commissioner. Tim oversees key components of Governor Malloy's economic development strategy, including tourism, brownfields redevelopment, transit-oriented development, uh, and waterfront initiatives. He also manages the state's still revolutionary uh, branding effort, which raises awareness about Connecticut as a great place to live and do business. Prior to joining DECD, Tim served as the chief of staff to the New York City uh, Deputy Mayor for Economic Development during the Bloomberg administration. In that role, Tim focused on key areas of city policy, including transportation and transit-oriented development, redevelopment in brownfields, and as New York City's waterfront policy coordinator, its port, waterfront, and maritime properties. Tim also developed city policy in the areas of housing, small business support, infrastructure finance, and public-private partnerships. He was a busy guy in, in New York. Um, he began his career in investment banking at Lehman Brothers in 2003 as a healthcare banker, focusing on mergers and acquisitions and capital market transactions for leading companies in the managed care biotech and healthcare services sectors. Prior to joining city government in 2010, Tim worked at Barclays Capital in New York as chief of staff to the head of global investment banking. Please join me in welcoming a good friend of the Naugatuck Valley region, Deputy Commissioner for Community and Economic Development, Tim Sullivan. Great. Good morning. Thanks, Rick, for that uh, very, very kind introduction. And um, it's a, a privilege and an honor to, to share the morning, uh, uh, the morning podium with Commissioner Redeker and Mayor O'Leary, two, uh, two people whose work and uh, in so many areas I admire. When I was just thinking, today is actually my two-year anniversary. So Rick mentioned January of 2014. Today is the specific two-year anniversary when I joined uh, Governor Malloy's team. I think the third or fourth day uh, is when I first met Mayor O'Leary up in the governor's office talking about all the kinds of vision for, that he has for, for Waterbury. And... Um, and so it's exciting to be back here talking about uh, some of those same issues with him. He, he teed up my remarks, as did uh, Commissioner Redeker, uh, perfectly. Um, so I, I thought what I'd do, um, usually in, uh, there's a lot of friends and familiar faces in the audience, um, and so most of you heard me talk about brownfields and why we think it's so important, and most of you can do that speech better than I can at this point. So I'm going to sort of step back and talk a little bit more broadly and try and uh, provide a little bit of context and some opinions. Feel free to take them or leave them. Uh, and some food for thought as you um, as spend the day thinking about uh, the, the next era of sort of the Naugatuck Valley's development and growth. Um, so m my main objective is, uh, is to talk about how Connecticut cities and towns can, can really best position themselves to, to, to compete and win in the 21st century economy. Um, and and to, to speed ahead and, and, and spoiler alert, you know, we're gonna talk, I'm going to talk a lot about all the things that are going on in cities across the country. And it's not just the mega cities that are doing the things that Mayor O'Leary was talking about, about reinventing their downtowns, reinventing their industrial bases. It's cities of all shapes and sizes in all parts of the country with all different kinds of hands of cards to play with respect to infrastructure and geography. And there are lessons to be learned for communities of all, uh, of all sizes and all, um, and all types. So um, I'll start by just sort of stepping back and trying to provide, uh, as is described in the slide, sort of an oversimplification uh, of kind of where we are in the, in the broader uh, economy. We're, we're really in the midst of a transformation, a transition into sort of the third um, sort of macro era of the American economy, starting with the agrarian age of, of agriculture and fur trade and the sort of the colonial era economy into the industrial age in which the Naugatuck Valley and lots of other places had um, you know, places of pride uh, in the national economy and driving American innovation. And then we're in probably the second, third, fourth, depending on how you count, uh, second or third or fourth decade uh, of the information age where, where knowledge uh, and is driving the economy. And if you think about sort of what the, the key competitive advantage was in each of those ages, it's really shifted and it, and it gets to what we need to be thinking about is how, as how we plan for the next 30, 40, 100 years of the information age. You know, in the agrarian age, your economy was, was driven mostly by land and, and topography and geography. If you had fertile soil, if you had good weather, you had a fighting chance in the agrarian age. In the industrial age, it was really about commodities and access to natural resources. Pittsburgh developed because of steel. Houston's where it is because of oil. San Francisco and its Golden Gate are there because people wanted to go find gold, uh, and, and that drove uh, success in the industrial age. In the, in the information age, the key commodity or the key uh, natural resource for growth 
is talent. It's people. Um, and that's true not just for digital startups and the Facebooks of the world and the sort of the sexy, high-tech, unicorn, Silicon Valley stories. That's true for really almost every industry in the tradable sector, in the export-based industries uh, of this information and knowledge economy. That's true in advanced manufacturing. It's true in anything that employs engineers. It's true of companies that are in financial services or green technology. All the industries we're trying to grow and attract uh, and that my boss, Commissioner Smith, um, is leading the charge to, to grow here in Connecticut and attract to, 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 come here from, uh, to come here to Connecticut. And so if the, fundamental, uh, if the fundamental objective is to attract talent and retain talent and create talent, we've really got to be talking about cities because that is overwhelmingly what we're seeing on a fundamental basis, um, I'm sorry, uh, on a fundamental basis for 21st century talent. 21st century talent wants to be in cities. It is the key to competing and winning in the information age. 50% of the world's population today lives in cities. That's an all-time record. It's projected to grow to 70% by 2050. And 86% of young people, I don't know exactly how young people is defined in this survey, but let's just call it under 40, say it's important to have opportunities to live and work without relying on a car. And not surprisingly, office tenants, companies, are following that trend. They say they want to locate in walkable, mixed-use places. I could fill my entire allotted time with public opinion data showing um, that young people and companies want to be in livable, walkable, mixed-use places. And it's manifesting itself in real economic results. This is not a trend. This is not uh, you know, an ambition or a, a, a sort of a theoretical uh, exercise at this point. If you look at US job growth from 2007 to 2011, and you look at it by location of job growth, city centers saw five, a 0.5% annual growth rate in employment. That's a big number in, in sort of the modern uh, US economy. 0.5% annual growth in jobs and employment. Outlying areas? So a 0.1% annual decline in jobs. That's a pretty big deal. That's a huge difference in growth rates uh, in, in an economy that, um, this, you know, obviously the Great Recession's in the middle of that, but um, as the economy transitions and continues to transition, that is a big deal. Um, suburban office vacancy, this slide's a little misleading. As I was driving in this morning, I was looking at it. It's not 5% higher than uh, urban. It's 500 basis points higher than urban uh, office vacancy. So I think urban office vacancy is something like 12% right now. Suburban office vacancy is 17%. This is showing up in how companies are thinking about where to locate and thinking about where to put their, their, their resources. And there's a lot of scholarship and there's a lot of interesting people doing a lot of interesting work about sort of why cities are um, doing so well. I just picked uh, Ed Glazer's book to put on the cover here, talking about, uh, he's a Harvard economist, talking about the triumph of the city. And, and it's a great book, everyone should read it, it's a, it's a good read. Um, and it talks about why cities are, um, are winning in the 21st century economy, and it's all the things that uh, we talk about all the time. It's, it's greener, it's more energy efficient, it's healthier to walk around, um, it preserves open space by growing in our cities, all those kinds of things. But it's also fundamentally about how the economy is working and how technology and the technology-sensitive industries are driving innovation and driving job growth. And um, there's a quote from um, Ed Glazer's book that I just want to read to you, um, talking about the role of technology in driving uh, re-urbanization, as Mayor O'Leary put it, uh, and, and a drive to urban economic development. He says, you know, for over a century, pundits have, predicting, have been predicting that new forms of communication would make urban life irrelevant. A hundred years ago, the telephone was supposed to make cities unnecessary. That didn't happen. Today, information technology is changing the world, making it more idea-intensive, better connected, and ultimately more urban. Improvements in information technology seem to have increased rather than reduced the value of face-to-face -face connections. The declining cost of connecting over long distances has only increased the returns to clustering close together. This is a nationwide trend that is happening all across the country, and you're seeing it in sort of the, some of the data that you can see on the screen. But again, this is not just a mega city story. This is not just New York and Boston and Chicago and San Francisco. It's certainly happening there, and it's happening at a bigger scale than it's happening uh, across the country. But across the country, there are lots of cities of lots of different shapes and sizes that are reinventing themselves for the 21st century economy. One I want to talk about, uh, and I think has a, a lot of applicability um, to where we're um, to where we are this morning in the Naugatuck Valley is Chattanooga, Tennessee. Chattanooga, Tennessee was the, one of the sort of the South's homes of heavy industry. It's in the, it's nestled in the Smoky, uh, I think it's the Smokies or some mountain range in the South, Tennessee. Um, and uh, on days back in the 50s and 60s when uh, the uh, heavy industrial base was at its peak, uh, Chattanooga is located in a river valley in between a bunch of mountains. 
where the factories were all located, the air quality was so poor, people used to have to stay inside. And the river was gross because of everyone discharging into the river. Well, that's all gone. And Chattanooga was you know, written off and left for dead. But what they did was capitalize on the assets they did have, including a river and a beautiful pedestrian bridge and a branch of a state university, Tennessee Chattanooga is located there, and then made some smart investments. Chattanooga was one of the early adopters of gig internet. And this was five or seven years ago when gig internet was you know, the stretch goal for, 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 um, for broadband capacity. They built an aquarium. They leveraged their, they reactivated their riverfront and their waterfront. And today, not only is Chattanooga growing as a population base, it's, increase, it's an increasing home for um, new economy companies. $50 million of venture capital investment went to uh, Chattanooga in 2014. That's a lot compared to the nothing that was being invested in Chattanooga uh, before they made some of these investments and reinvented themselves using technology, using the assets they have, making themselves more pedestrian friendly. And I would submit to you with a much worse hand of ge geographic cards and infrastructure cards than we have, no rail here. Lowell, Massachusetts, um, you know, population 106,000, reinvented its mills. Asheville, North Carolina used arts uh, to reposition itself as a, a, a hub for young people. Portland, Maine uh, is a, small a relatively small city that has made ports and arts sort of the centerpiece of its reinvention. Burlington, Vermont, 42,000 people, geographically in the middle of nowhere, basically. Former mayor, Bernie Sanders, by the way. Um, you know, leveraged uh, its identity as a, a sort of the University of Vermont's hometown to reinvent itself as a waterfront and uh, brewery-driven economy. There's a lot of brewing happening in Burlington. You know, breaking news, college kids like beer. Um, and so they invented themselves as a brewing community. Great Barrington, Massachusetts, a little town, 7,000, sort of positioning itself as kind of the, the urban capital of the Berkshires. So spend the weekend in the Berkshires, but come into Great Barrington for dinner in a great restaurant, see a show. There's all different kinds of playbooks that can be run for cities of all different kinds of sizes. Um, and so what are some things we should be thinking about? And these, again, these are all opinions. Feel free to take them or leave them. Um, but you know, steps that every city and town can be taking to position itself for the 21st century economy. Um, the little picture there should be familiar from Commissioner Redeker's uh, slides. The governors, I would start with thinking about transit uh, and everything that uh, Commissioner Redeker just talked about and everything that Governor Malloy is focusing on in terms of the $100 billion investment in transportation, a big chunk of it for transit. If I was a mayor in the Naugatuck Valley, I'd wake up every day thinking about how do I support um, and encourage uh, and advocate for the transit investment that this corridor needs to, to really um, accelerate its growth. 21st century infrastructure, uh, uh, Comptroller Lembo is going to be here later talking about broadband. Uh, we saw it in Chattanooga. It's a really important asset. We can argue about how to do it and how to finance it and who should pay for it, and that's a good, fair argument. Um, but should we have super high speed broadband is a little bit like saying, should we have electricity or not? It's, it's not really something we can not have. And it's not just uh, broadband, it's things like energy, uh, you know, alternative energy, fuel cells, solar, all those kinds of good things that, that communities need to be more resilient and also to have a lower cost in, uh, energy. Support your anchor institutions. We're in one this morning. Arts institutions, universities, hospitals. They're big employers, they're big purchasers, they, have, they attract activity. When an anchor institution wants to expand, the answer is yes, how can we help? Um, and it should be yes, how can we help? Um, branding and identity. Um, I'm going to steal a line from uh, the Brookings Institution's Bruce Katz, who stole it from Dolly Parton. Um, find out who you are and do it on purpose. You have to have a brand and an identity that's more than just quality of life in good schools. Everybody says they've got quality of life in good schools. That's necessary but insufficient. People want to identify and people want to move and be in places that have integrity, that have history, that have authenticity. And the Valley's got that coming out of its ears. It's the industrial heritage in this area is a remarkably strong asset to market, whether it's brass or rubber or clocks or wiffle balls or whatever you, whatever you want to point to. There's real authenticity and, and integrity in what's going on here and what's happened here in the last uh, 100 years. It's, you've got to position yourself. You've got to brand yourself and make a, a conscientious decision to embrace your heritage, embrace your identity. Go back to Burlington, Vermont. Right, college kids like beer, that's pretty funny, right, ha, ha, ha. They turned it into a real business because they embraced being a brewing community. They embraced, they, they made infrastructure investments to encourage those companies to locate there and expand there and be successful, and that's a real business. It's not, I mean, some of it's, I'm sure people like to drink too much beer, and that's fine, but they're making, they're making, they're real companies that are growing, uh, and, 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 and that's manufacturing, right? Brewing is manufacturing. Um, it's about embracing your identity, em embracing who you are, embracing what your identity is, and leveraging it, and marketing it, and promoting it. Um, 
And it's about clean, you know, being clean and safe. You know, Mayor O'Leary mentioned earlier the safety statistics for, for water rights. That's a story you can't tell enough, particularly in, in re-urbanizing contexts. Um, focus on the public realm. Uh, again, Commissioner Redeker talked about this um, in, his, uh, in his talk as well, but not just parks, but plazas, parklets, bike lanes, street furniture, waterfront areas, public art, all relatively low-cost investment that have a tremendously high impact. The psychic returns on a planter that's maintained with flowers that are watered and cared for sends such a signal not only to your residents, but to, business to the business community, to developers, to people who are thinking about moving to your city or town. Someone's home, the lights are on, someone's paying attention. This is a community that's investing in itself. And it's like a couple of bucks a week to you know, water, the, water the flowers and make sure they're being taken care of. And if someone vandalizes them, you replace them. It, the huge psychic effect. The, can, you know, the uh, phrase a few cans of paint references things like bike lanes. And you know, Commander, Commissioner Redeker uh, talked about the $100 million investment. Um, I think Connecticut was the first New England state to do a complete streets manual. Is that right? First Northeastern New England? First Northeastern New England state to do a complete streets manual. That's really important. Some of those are pretty low cost investments. If you, a bike lane is not all that expensive to put in. The complicated best ones are a little more expensive, but these are investments that can be funded out of your, out of your existing resources, and you've got to do them. Um, Innovation-friendly zoning. Um, you know, embrace co-working, embrace live workspace, em uh, en enable car sharing, change your parking regulations to enable car sharing. You've got to focus on mixed use. Everyone think, people think of mixed use as sort of this you know, newfangled vanguard of zoning. It's, in fact you know, monoline zoning, that's the historical anomaly. And traditionally, our cities and our towns developed around having all kinds of mixes of uses together. So that means encouraging things like upper floor residential, it means encouraging mixed income, it means encouraging local retail. Right? If you think about having an authentic brand and an authentic identity, um, national chain retail isn't going to get you there. Um, you know, the, the hot dog place that's been there for 75 years and the same family's owned and run it, um, run it, Jesus, owned and ran it, um, you know, help them make a second location. That's a great story. That's a great investment. And then the failure rate of that investment is going to be much lower than trying to find someone to start up a new company, a new hot dog stand. And then finally, and I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail because I can't help myself, but thinking about adaptive reuse in brownfields. You know, the mayor talked about all the brownfields that, are, uh, that him and his, he and his team are focused on in Waterbury. It's not just brownfields, by the way. Adaptive reuse of old abandoned infrastructure. Think about the High Line in New York City. That was a falling down freight rail system that was ready to get torn down, and now it's one of the biggest tourist attractions in the world. $135 million of investment. A lot of money, but in the grand scheme of things, the return on that is astonishing. And it's, and it's embracing, again, embracing... Um, the past, embracing your, your legacy uh, infrastructure is really important and can provide enormous returns. And brownfields and adaptive, adaptive reuse and thinking about old factories and old mills, um, developers who used to work in investment banking don't tend to quote Jane Jacobs all the time, but I will hear. Um, new ideas need old buildings, right? This is a, kind of a tried and true uh, adaptive reuse uh, uh, orthodoxy. Um, brownfield uh, redevelopment and particularly historic uh, preservation and adaptive reuse of brownfields, it's one of the biggest clubs we have in the bag. Um, it's always um, tough to follow Commissioner Redeker when he gives a talk because he, he counts in billions. We tend to count in millions in our, uh, in our, in our budgets. But um, since fiscal 2012, uh, under Governor Malloy's leadership, the state's invested uh, now $140 million in more than 100 projects. Uh, brownfield projects across the state. There's a real focus and prioritization on transit-oriented development, on historic preservation. I should note on affordable housing as well. Those are all bonus point areas um, that we're encouraging uh, because we want to encourage the kind of redevelopment that we're talking about this morning. And importantly, we're attracting lots of leverage on that investment. For every dollar the state's invested, that 140 above, $4.99 has been or will be invested by non-state partners. The Marketing person in me really wants to round that up to five bucks, but the accountant says 4.99 is the right number. And the the trend is moving in the right direction too. For the fund, the projects that we've put under contract so far this fiscal year, it's up to 8.37 for every dollar we've put in. So there's increasingly attraction of um, what the rest of the world thinks of. First, when they hear the letters OPM in Connecticut, we think of Secretary Barnes, but in in the rest of the world, OPM means other people's money. Um, 8.37 for every dollar invested by the state is, is pretty, pretty good and a good start. There's $40 million of new funding authorized for the, the two fiscal years we're in the middle of right now. That's up from 30 in the previous biennium. And we recently just awarded um, 
uh, six new, six grants under a new program called the Brownfield Area-Wide Revitalization Grant, which is a comprehensive planning grant looking beyond actually just the brownfield issues that are uh, uh, resident in so many of our communities. Thinking about comprehensive planning for how to think about multiple brownfields, not just one site and how do you clean it up, but if you clean up several brownfields, what kind of infrastructure investment, what kind of streetscape improvements, what kind of planning considerations are there, uh, including a, a grant to Mayor O'Leary and his team in Waterbury um, to uh, to, um, to, to advance the planning of uh, five or six different uh, city-owned brownfields on the south end. Um, so we're, really make, we're trying to make a, a variety of tools available. I should note, I can see uh, Mark Lewis and Sheila are here from Deep, but our partners at Deep um, are, are fantastic partners and uh, brothers and sisters in arms uh, in the fight to uh, remediate brownfields and redevelop them in the right way. And we can't do anything without them. They're in, they're in charge of what's clean and what's not. So that's a, that they're in critical colleagues in that. So um, I'll wrap up. Um, with just some thoughts about how you how to how to think about sort of a roadmap for revitalization because it doesn't happen overnight. Reurbanization won't happen overnight. Mayor O'Leary talked about the uh, long history of uh, the projects in Waterbury that he's been championing. Championing. Um, it doesn't happen on its own. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a real plan. It takes real thought. It takes a lot of work. It can't be something you do in your spare time. It can't be something that a part-time economic development person and a part-time planner um, spend time thinking about. But first and foremost, the basics come first. And that means on a municipal level, basic things like sanitation, plowing snow, uh, keeping your parks in good shape, you know, cleaning the streets. You earn the right to do big things by showing developers, by showing residents, by tenants, by showing companies that you can do the simple things. If you, someone comes to City Hall looking for uh, you know, advice or guidance or support for a project and they have to fill out a form and triplicate and hand it to someone who clearly hasn't used a computer, that's customer repellent, as they say in the retail business. Um, you have to be able to do the basics. You have to be able to do the basics right to be able to earn the right to do the complicated stuff. This morning's a great example, but you've got to think and act regionally. I've been here two years. Um, I, there's not nearly enough examples of uh, times my phone has rung from a you know, municipal official or just anyone saying, hey, I heard about this project in this other town. It's great. You guys got to make sure it gets done. What's good for Waterbury is good for the whole region. What's good for the whole region is good for Waterbury. What's good for New London is good for, what's, is good for the valley. It's a relatively small state. It's a relatively small economy. It doesn't respect political boundaries. We've got to think and act more regionally, whether that means infrastructure and some of the things that Commissioner Redeker is talking about around the, the branch lines or whether it's about individual projects in any given community. A company you know, growing and expanding in one, in, in one urban place is really good for the suburban communities too because they're going to want to live somewhere when they get a little older. Their kids are going to gonna want schools that are, um, they're going to want some more land. You got to have that engine of our urban uh, economies fueling uh, the future of our suburban and rural communities. Um, one cautionary note, beware of mega projects. You don't get there all in one big bite. Um, mega projects are a little bit like buying your kid a pony. It feels like a good idea. It's exciting. They're, they love it. They open it up, but they're enormously difficult to, to raise. They're extremely expensive to feed and maintain, and they tend to uh, under-deliver on the promise, that you, uh, the promise that you've been sold. So beware mega projects. But at the same time, you've got to be willing to be proactive and aggressive to fight for the right opportunities. Um, that means if, you, if the city needs to buy property, if the town needs to buy property, if you need to do a tax abatement, if you need to... Pr uh, pr uh, provide uh, tax incentives or capital. You've got to be willing to do it because this won't happen overnight. Reurbanization fundamentally re uh, is an outgrowth or a, is a cousin of brownfield redevelopment, which is a market failure. The market is not going to solve these problems necessarily by themselves. There needs to be support, not only from the federal government, not only from the state government. There needs to be activity and energy from the local government as well. So I would end on an optimistic note. I think um, the encouraging thing for me as I look around the room and uh, said hi to a bunch of people this morning on the way in, a lot of towns and, and cities are already um, doing a lot of this, thinking a lot about this. We have to continue to prioritize it, and we have to continue to support one another in pursuing these kinds of projects and pursuing these kinds of development ideas. The state, under Governor Malloy's leadership, is providing unprecedented resources and investment, not just in the transportation area that Commissioner Redeker talked about, but in brownfields, and affordable housing, and in infrastructure, in, uh, in all, all different and support for companies that are coming to Connecticut and growing in Connecticut. There is an unprecedented amount of resources available. The state agencies are working really well together. Um, we are partnering together to make sure that key products get done. There is, you know, there is a, a big tailwind um, behind the kind of projects that we're talking about, and the kind of reurbanization and the, the invigoration of cities and downtowns, because it is the it is the key to the 20, 21st and 22nd century economy. And if Connecticut is going to position itself to compete and win in that economy, we've got to strengthen our cities, we've got to strengthen our downtowns, and we're making some progress, but we've got to keep working hard as hell on it, otherwise it won't happen.
So thanks for having me this morning. It was great to be here. Appreciate the chance to uh, visit with you and offer some opinions. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Tim. Great as always.